Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple of things uh, before we get into the series. And we're going to go through a bunch of miracles that Jesus did leading up to Easter. But before we get there, I wanted to share with you one of the miracles that Jesus did, but kind of in a different context. Because I want you to see, um, I, I want it to make sense to your life. Does that make sense? I want you to be able to apply it to your so we're going to be talking about miracles. Uh, listen to this verse. Psalm 77, verse 14. You are the God of miracles. You are the God of miracles and wonders. You still demonstrate your awesome power. I know when we talk about the Bible a lot, we talk about past tense, right? 2,000 years ago, uh, you know, they did this and, and they did that. I'm talking about present tense because we believe at United Church that our God does miracles. And we believe that he wants to do a miracle in you and in your life. We believe that God wants to do a miracle in you and in your life. And that doesn't just involve you. you miracles usually involve people around you as well, too. And that's, and that's a beautiful thing. Job 5 verse 9 says, He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. And I, I, I've seen this firsthand. I've seen miracles happen firsthand. When I was 17 years old, I was in a car accident where I should have died, and, and I'm standing here. I've, I've seen miracles happen before in my life. And um, I believe that our God is a God of miracles. He wants to do miracles. And I, I, I want to read to you a particular passage of Scripture that many of us have heard before. But I want to give it to you in two different, I want to package it in two different ways. One of, of, one of caution and one of care, if I could do it like that. I'm going to give you this passage of Scripture, but I'm packaging it two ways. One of caution and one of care. John 11. If you have your Bible, John 11. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. And this might be a familiar passage to many people, but, uh, but I want you to trek with me this morning. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Father, I ask for a couple minutes, Lord Jesus, that you would give us great grace. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give a spirit of knowledge and revelation, Lord Jesus, in every heart, in every mind. Lord, we love you so much, and we're here to learn, and we're here to grow. Father, I ask that you help me be a good steward of this moment, Lord Jesus. I pray that you bring great understanding and revelation, Lord every passage of scripture I don't hold the words of life you do and I ask that you pour them out Lord Jesus into every heart in Jesus name Amen Amen. many of you are familiar with this passage of scripture about a man named Lazarus Lazarus was one of Jesus's great friends and Lazarus got sick and died and Lazarus Jesus is very close friends with Lazarus' family, Mary and Martha. They're, 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 they're tight, you know. When Jesus would come to town, he'd fellowship, he'd break bread, he'd hang out, you know. Him and Lazarus would take walks and talk and all kinds of stuff. And, and, and they were close. They were so close that when the sisters sent word for Jesus, they used language like this. Lord, the one you love is sick. 
Um, that's not that's not normal. That's not that's you, they, there's not many other verses that you read through the Bible where somebody sends a message like that towards Jesus. The one that you love is sick. So we obviously know that there's a very very close relationship there between Jesus and Lazarus, because the sisters are saying the one you love is sick, and Jesus hears it, and he says the sickness is not going to end in death but we're going to use it for God's glory. The sickness is not going to end in death, but we're going to use it for God's glory because God doesn't waste anything in our life. He uses every circumstance, every situation. He, he, might, not be, he might not be the one allowing you to, uh, to, 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 to go through it head on alone, but he wants to use it to grow you, to mature you, whether it's on the outside or mostly usually on the inside. So what we see here in this passage of Scripture, I told you I want to give you a tale of caution and then a tale of care. What we see in the Scripture are two different things. And the first thing that happens is Lazarus gets sick and the sisters become worried. And there's a pattern that follows here, and I think it's a cautionary tale for all of us, and it's something that I call the death trap, the death trap. And it starts, John 11, verse 6, yet when they heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. So the sisters are confused. The townspeople are confused. Everybody's confused. I mean, like, everybody's confused. Everybody's like, well, he's Jesus. He does miracles. He's on this earth. This is what he does. He does miracles. Lazarus is the one that he loves. They must be super, 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 super tight. And Jesus sits back for two more days. But Jesus had already prophesied prior to sitting back, for two more days that it wasn't going to end in death. But nobody was worried about what Jesus said. Everybody was worried about what Jesus did. So not very many people were worried about what Jesus said. More people were worried about what Jesus did than actually what Jesus said. That's why we're calling this the death trap, because this is how it starts. We start to question Jesus, or maybe I could put it this way. We don't understand how God works. We don't, we don't understand how God works. And because we don't understand how God works, because his ways are higher than our ways, and we're called simply just to trust and put our hope in him, but because we're mortal bodies and we're people, we lose trust very easily. Come on, somebody. We lose trust, don't we? We lose trust very, very easily. Like very, very easily. You could lie to me once and I'll never trust you again. I mean, that's how the world works. We, we lose trust so easy. But this is step one of what they started going through they didn't understand how Jesus was working, how God was working. He prophesied that it was not going to end in death, but God was going to be glorified through the situation. They didn't know what that meant. They just saw him sit back for two more days. See, when we begin to understand, that's why Solomon said, the smartest man who ever lived, there's nothing more than you can get than knowledge and understanding of who God is. If you can gain knowledge and understanding of who God is, that's what you should seek more than anything else, is knowledge and understanding of who God is. Because when you have knowledge and understanding of who God is, you might not know all his ways, but you know who he is, and you know that his ways are higher than our ways. So you're free to put your trust in him because even though it doesn't make sense to you, you know what he prophesied before he did it. 
if you understand his word, if you un- spend time in his word, but they're, 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 they're falling into this place, this death trap, where they don't understand how God works. John 11, 11, 13 says, after he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. We don't understand how God works. Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And they're like, whoa, it, let, him, let him sleep. Let, let, let him sleep in. He's sleeping in today. It's Saturday. They, they, they don't understand how God works. See, he wasn't talking about waking him up out of a sleep. He was talking about raising him from the dead. But they don't understand how God works. We don't understand a lot of time how God works. They replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus was speaking of his death, but his disciples thought that he meant natural sleep. They don't understand how how Jesus works, how God works, that he works all things for our good. Even though we can't see it, even if we don't feel it, God is still moving and working on our behalf. You don't need to feel Jesus in order for Jesus to work in your life. You don't need to feel God in order for God to move in your life. You don't need to feel the Holy Spirit with with knowing that the Holy Spirit is, is going before you and around you and all over you and looking out for you. We don't understand how God works, and we don't have to understand completely how God works. But when you get into the Word, you start understanding God's ways. And when you start understanding God's ways, you understand that He works all things for your good. So you could start trusting in Him more, and things start making more sense. So instead of saying, let the guy sleep in, it's okay. If he sleeps, he'll be refreshed. That you know what he's saying. I'm bringing, I'm bringing life back where there was lifelessness. I'm bringing understanding back where there was a lack of understanding. I'm bringing strength back where strength was depleted. I'm bringing joy back where joy was depleted. I'm bringing comfort back where comfort was depleted. I'm not talking about waking somebody up. I'm talking about resurrecting. I'm talking about bringing back to life that which was dead. Because nothing is too hard for me. See, I don't understand completely how he works, but I understand some of his ways. So my trust in him is greater than my fear of the world. I'll say that again. My trust in Jesus is greater than my fear of the world. And when you could start doing that, the world becomes a little bit easier. Doesn't become a lot a bit easier. It becomes a little bit easier. Because we begin to understand God's ways. The second thing that happened here is they became consumed with doubt. When you understand when you don't understand something, you doubt it. Right? When you don't understand something, you, you question it. Because I don't understand it, I'm questioning it. I don't understand why I'm feeling so much pain, so I'm questioning if I'm even supposed to be here. I, I don't understand why I'm experiencing all these things, so maybe this wasn't meant for me. We, we become consumed with doubt, we start doubting the, the, the one that loves us. We start doubting the one that has saved us multiple times. Jesus could have delivered you a billion and six times, but you still doubt. You still don't understand. You still question. God's got you through it before. He's made a way before where you thought there was no way, but you start to doubt because you're in the trap. You start to doubt because you're in the trap. And you're saying, I feel hopeless. I don't understand any of this. I'm doubting. It got to the point where John 11, 16, Thomas called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we might die with him.
I, I don't understand any of this. None of this makes sense. Let's just all go die. <laughs> Did he got it messed up? Let, let, let's, all, let's just all go die. We're consumed with doubt. I'm, I'm uncertain what's going to happen. I'm uncertain how things are going to play out. I just lost my job, and you don't understand. We don't have enough money for bills. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm not sure how God's going to make a way. I'm not sure if God's going to open doors for me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We don't understand. We become consumed with doubt. It's the death trap. And then the final step after a lack of understanding and being full of doubt is we start to give up on God. We start to give up on God. Because I don't understand and I like to understand. Come on, somebody. Where's all my like to understand people? Yeah, right? Just a little. I, I, just, I like to understand just a little of what I'm getting myself into. And then you get consumed with doubt because the, the, the lack of understanding or, or the limitations of your understanding are leaning to, more towards doubt than they are towards faith. So because I have, I have so little understanding and because I'm doubting so much, I'm starting to give up. That's why the majority of people, you speak to the majority of people, you see the majority of people, first thing they give up on, they stop coming to church. I've been, Monday through Saturday was crazy. I, I worked my butt off. And then we, we were at the bar for two days. And uh, I don't think I can make it to church Sunday. I'm going through some hard times. I'm just going to drink the pain away. I'm just going to drink the doubt away. I'm just going to drink the lack of understanding away. I, I, I'm, just gonna, I'm just giving up and just giving in. I'm just giving up and giving in. John 11, verses 17 and 20. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard Jesus was coming. She went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Mar Mar Martha went, 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 went to go see him, but Mary stayed at home. She, she was in the trap. He's been dead. It's been four days. I, I'm, I'm glad Jesus is here. I'll, I'll see him when he comes to the house. I'll say hi to him. Mar Martha went. Mary stayed. In the trap, I don't understand why. If Jesus loves him so much, why did he wait two days? He probably doesn't care. The death trap. You see what I'm saying? You see, you see why I wanted to package this two ways, give you some caution and then give you some care? Because if we're not cautious, we get caught in the death trap every single day of our lives. Something is going to happen that you're not going to understand. Something is going to happen and you might doubt a little bit. You might get hurt by someone or something and you might want to give up on everything. But breakthrough is on the other side of not giving up. And I know breakthrough is a great Christianese word. But I'm telling you, God's blessing, God's best is on the other side of not giving up. It's on the other yeah. side of not giving up. He didn't call us to give up. He called us to trust. Jesus said, all things are possible for those who believe. Yes, yes, yes. All, all you have to do is believe. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. I know you don't understand. I know you don't understand. But here's the thing about the death trap that we can rejoice in that we can rejoice in the death trap? Did he really just say that? Yes, we can rejoice in it. It's like the boys being thrown in the fire. Jesus is with us. Jesus is with us. And what Jesus is showing us in this passage of Scripture is death is never final. Death is never final. 
That's what he's showing us in this passage of Scripture. You might not understand how I work. You might have plenty of doubt. You might want to give up. But death is never final. I'm, I'm here today to prove to you, to let you know, to... To, 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 to form inside of your understanding that you can trust me, that you can put your hope in me, that you can walk with me, that everything's going to be okay. If you believe, all you have to do is believe and don't give up. It might not make sense. You might doubt a little bit. Those, that's okay. That's, that, that's okay. But don't give up. Don't give up because death is never final. John eleven twenty five twenty six. 25, 26, Jesus said to her, I am the, rec- the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked this very specific, specific question because now we're moving on to the care portion of the conversation. We're leaving, we're, we're, we're leaving the caution, and now we're moving to the care. Jesus asked them this question. He made this statement and finished it with a question. I am the way, the truth, the life. You want to have life, it's in me. You, 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 you want to have life, it's in me. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. The promise of eternity, the promise of heaven. Come on, somebody. The promise of eternity, the promise of heaven. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and he, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asked them a question. Do you believe this? I, I, I want to know if you believe this. Before I even do anything, before I even call his name, before I say a word, do you believe in this? Make up in your heart, make up in your mind who Jesus is. Make up in your mind, make up in your heart, settle in your heart who Jesus is. If you can make up in your mind and settle in your heart who Jesus is, you can't be shaken. You're like a tree planted by the water. The wind might come and the wind might blow and the tree might move back and forth, but your roots are covered in Jesus. Settle in your heart who Jesus is. Listen to what Martha says. John 11, 21, 22. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would, have not, would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She settled in her heart who Jesus was. That's why she went to him. She, she knew who Jesus was. She knew the power that Jesus had. She knew that it didn't matter that Lazarus had been dead four days. She said, I, I, if you would have been here, there's no doubt in my mind that Lazarus wouldn't die. But guess what? You're here now, so I think he's going to get back up. I've settled in my heart who Jesus is. I, I've settled in my heart who Jesus is is we we have to settle in our heart who Jesus is in our lives to us to me too many people are overexposed and underdeveloped too many people they're overexposed and underdeveloped give me a platform give me a microphone platforms don't raise you up platforms expose you And Jesus is saying, I, I, do you believe this? I want you to settle in your heart before I go any further who I am. Because if, if you can settle in your heart before you even see me do anything, that's counted towards your faith. Come on, somebody. That's counted towards your faith. That you don't need to see to believe that you just believe Because that's what's going to happen to us more times than not. You're going to see or you're going to believe. Uh, I kind of like a combination of both. (laughs) 
kind of like, kind of like a little glimpse, but I also believe. What happens when you don't get a glimpse? What happens when you get a sour taste in your mouth? What happens when instead of getting blessed, you get broken? Settle in your heart who Jesus is. Jesus is the Lord of my life. There's no one higher. There's no one greater. Jesus is the Lord of my life. He's Lord and Savior. He's not just Lord. He's not just Savior. He's Lord and Savior of my life. Because you got a lot of people that will make him Lord, but he's not Savior. you got a lot of people that will make him Savior, but he's not Lord. He's Lord and Savior of my life. I, I know who I am in Jesus. And though Lazarus might be dead, I know my Jesus can do anything. I know my Jesus can do anything. Martha said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Martha, she already made up in her mind who Jesus was. There was no doubt for her. Thinking, think about that, walking into a room and not having doubt, not having confusion. But I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who's going to be here. I don't know what's going on. But I know who I am in Jesus. And I know if God is for me, who could be against me? So I, I could walk into this room a little bit differently than some people can because I have a confidence in me that can't be shaken. See, I made up my mind a long time ago. The, the enemy could try to take a lot of things from me. People could take a lot, try to take a lot of things from me. But one thing nobody could take away from me is my confidence in Jesus. Hallelujah. It's the one thing nobody could take from me is my confidence in Jesus because I've seen him do it before. I, I've seen him do it before. I believe that, you're the, that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Settle in your heart who Jesus is. We can make up our minds this morning. We can make up our minds today. Jesus, you are my Savior. You're my Lord and Savior. There's no one higher than me. In, in, in my heart, I, I, I know I might make mistakes. I, I know I might trip over my own feet. I know I might stick my foot in my mouth. Come on, somebody. I, I, I know I'm, I might get angry. I know I might. But, I, but Jesus, you are number one in my heart. You are number one in my heart. Number one in my heart. You're number one in my heart. And because you're number one in my heart, I know you're taking care of every situation. You're working all things out. You're working all things for my good. You're opening the window of heaven and pouring out more than I can contain. You're doing it all on my behalf. You're doing it all on my behalf. It's the Lord who, who gives man the ability to make money. It, it, God, all these things are from you and through you. They're not because of me. They're because of you. I've settled in my heart who Jesus is. Here's the second thing. Stop analyzing everything. Hello? Stop analyzing everything. Stop analyzing everything. I mean, just, 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 just stop doing. This isn't Mission Impossible. Nobody needs you. I mean, we need you. You know what I mean? I don't need you coming down from a helicopter into my living room, and you're like, "Wait, I got the answer." Stop analyzing everything. Sometimes all we have to do is trust. Sometimes God just wants you to trust. He just wants you to just step out into the unknown and trust and use, utilize your faith. Activate your faith. Activate your faith. Activate your faith. God, help me to stop analyzing. I, where are my analyzers at? I'm, a, I'm thinking... I'm trying to think 15 steps ahead, and I'm trying to this, and I'm trying to that, and I'm trying to this, and then you start getting frustrated because things are out of your control, and then there's things that you can't control, and then circumstances or situations start to happen, and it wasn't according to your plan.
didn't go according to your plan. When I was a young man, there was a show I used to watch, and at the end of the show, the guy put a cigar in his mouth and said, I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> 18. Stop overanalyzing everything. We got we to gotta trust. We got to put our trust in, in the one who created us. We got to put the trust in the one who's renewed our mind. We got to put our trust in the one who's healed our body. We got to put our trust in the one who continues to provide for us time and time and time and time and time. Again, we got to put our trust in Jesus. People are going to hurt you. We've said this a million times. I'm going to hurt you. Pastor Leslie probably won't hurt you, but I probably <laughs> will hurt you. But it, it, we got to put our trust in Jesus and stop overanalyzing everything and everyone and every circumstance and every situation. We have to have the answer for everything. We have to know what's going on. We have to, we have to figure things out. Leslie, we'll be driving down the side of the road, and Leslie will tell you exactly how the car broke down, what time it broke down, where it broke down, when it broke. Oh, the tire must have came off while he was trying to make a right, but he couldn't make it to the exit, so he pulled off right there, and then he jacked it up. But then the jack probably broke, so now he's just waiting for the tow. I'm like, who? I didn't ask you anything. I didn't ask you a single question. She's, she's, she, she's analyzing it. She's analyzing it. Stop overanalyzing everything. John 11, 38, 39. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by, the time, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been dead there four days. Stop overanalyzing everything. Jesus isn't concerned. You're concerned. Jesus isn't concerned. If Jesus isn't worried, why are you worried? If God's not worried, why are you worried? Well, you don't understand. No, you don't understand. It wasn't that easy. Somebody had to roll away the stone. What do you mean? I never heard that. I never, I, didn't, didn't the stone just roll? <laughs> no. About 27 guys put ropes around it and had to pull it off. Had to roll the stone away. And then Martha said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to smell bad. He's, he's been, Jesus isn't worried. He's not worried about hard work. He's not worried about bad smell. And by bad smell, you could put anything in there. Bad attitude, bad reputation, bad intentions, bad, bad decisions. I mean, we could, we, could put, we could put anything in there. He's not worried about anything. He, he, he's not worried about the hard work. He's not worried about the smell. He's not worried about any of that, but we're overanalyzing. Jesus, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. Jesus, if we did it, if we did it this way, it would be so much easier than that way. Thanks, thanks for telling me how to be God. Good job there, pal. You can't even balance your checkbook and you're telling me how to be God. Stop overanalyzing everything. Stop overanalyzing. Come on, somebody. Let me free you in the name of Jesus. Stop overanalyzing everything. Put your hope and your trust in Jesus. It might not make sense to you right now, but it will. At some point, it will. Either it's going to make sense to you or you're going to use it in your testimony. God's going to use it. He's going to use it for your good. Nothing is wasted in the kingdom. Stop overanalyzing everything. Number three, third thing I wrote down 
is start living again. Start living again. Jesus wasn't concerned with the hard work. Jesus wasn't concerned with the bad smell. Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus wasn't concerned with the hard work. He wasn't concerned with the bad smell. He was concerned with Lazarus living again. He wasn't worried about the work. Because he knew that the work would get done. He wasn't worried about the smell because he knew the smell would be gone. He just wanted Lazarus to live again. His hands were bound. His mouth, his eyes, his face was bound. Remove the grave clothes. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. I love that. I love that so much. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. What do you mean? I can just see it now. Naked Lazarus running around town just <laughs> screaming. Woo! I was dead four days. Look, I don't smell no more. I ain't got no grave clothes on no more. He wasn't naked, but... I, I, I let him go. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let him go. Let him go forth. Let him share the testimony. Let him tell people what happened. Let him tell people that I could have came that same day. I could have been there in a couple of hours, but I decided to hang back because God needed to have all the glory in the situation in your life. You needed to tell this story about how God raised you from the dead. You needed to tell the story about how God took the grave clothes off. You need to tell the story about how, how, how I'm so in love with you that I'll go through any length, any extent to make sure that you're happy and healthy. Things might not be perfect, but happy and healthy. Instead of believing what I see, I choose to believe what Jesus says. Instead of believing what I see, I choose to believe what Jesus says. Come on, somebody. Instead of believing what I see, I choose to believe what Jesus says. I'm going to close with this real quick. Um, Zach told me it's called an acrostic. I think I called it an apostle before yeah I called it acupuncture or something like that I, the word trust you may wonder what it really means to trust God I'm going to help you by giving you this T stands for trust which means that if you're going to trust him, you have to take him at his word. Even if it seems like it's not true, you need to take him at his word. If we will take him at his word, he'll guide us through the course of life and bring us across the finish line safely. If you take Jesus at his word, Jesus will take you through your worst. If you take Jesus at his word, Jesus will take you through your worst. R stands for rest. The Bible tells us to rest in the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Do not worry. I heard somebody say, Worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't take you anywhere. U stands for understanding. 
Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not with some of your heart. Not with most of your heart. Not with 11% of your heart. It says to trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know, a lot of us, we, we, we long and we, we, we long for earthly relationships. Somebody to hold hands with, somebody to laugh with, share good moments with, share hard moments with. But God says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Sometimes things just don't make sense to our own understanding. And we have to understand that we can trust in the Lord at all times. Especially, especially when things don't make sense. S is pretty important to me things started changing in my life. S stands for speech. Our speech is an expression of our faith. I'm going to say that again. Our speech is an expression of our faith. In Mark 11, Jesus said, have faith in God. And then the very next thing he said is, whoever says to this mountain, be removed be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done he will have whatever he says our faith in God is expressed through our speech I heard somebody say it this way speak what you expect speak what you expect an important piece to that we need to have God's word in our heart the Bible says that I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you we need to get God's word deep down inside of our hearts deep down inside of our hearts no matter if we're struggling on the outside if the word of the Lord is deep inside of our heart, it's an anchor. It becomes an anchor. I remember we were at the beach. We were walking down the beach. This little rock, this little rock like this, you know, this little thing, and it's sticking out of the ground. And I, you know, I thought I was going to punt it 750 miles, you know. I kicked this thing and I broke my toe with 99 pieces. <laughs> oh my God. Because this much was sticking out, but it was probably this long. There's, there's nothing worse than being seven miles wide and half an inch deep. Sometimes we spread ourselves so thin that the trust the understanding, the speech. All those things begin to suffer because we're just giving in to our skin. And that's part of the death trap. But Jesus wants to give us new life. The final T stands for thanksgiving. this goes along with your speech we offer thanksgiving to God in advance when you speak to God God likes to hear you say thanks in advance not because he's bougie he has streets of gold is all I'm saying but because he likes to know that you're so confident in him that before
before you even start asking, you start thanking. He wants to know that you're so confident in him that before you start asking, you start thanking. God, I don't know how this is going to happen, but thank you in advance. You're the God of the impossible. I love what the ladies said about surprise. You guys don't know this, but Leslie's been using that language for a little while now. The last couple of years, she's like, man, I just, just wish God would just surprise us. Just surprise us. And she uses that in her speech. But when we pray, we start with thanksgiving. We offer thanksgiving to God in advance. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, be anxious for nothing. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. And I just, I wish it would just stick. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. There's nothing that God can't do. There's nothing that God can't do. If you seek first the kingdom, there's nothing that God can't do. If you put God first in your life, there's nothing that God can't do. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. When we offer thanks to God, it's an expression of our faith. That truly is trust. Let's stand together. I, I, I just. Um, I hope I hope this made sense to you. And I hope this was good. You know, um, that death trap can can happen really, really quick. And I just felt in my heart like we could just take a minute. Um, 2 Corinthians seven verse ten says, "Godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted." God might be moving in your heart. You might be feeling something inside. I think this is just a good moment for us, a good opportunity just to rest for a second. Rest in the peace of God. We don't have to hurry. We don't have to rush. Jesus lived an unhurried life, an unrushed life. We see it even in this, this, this verse here that he remained two more days. He was unhurried. He, 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 he trusted. He knew who he was. He knew he was God. He knew his heavenly father could do anything. In this moment, we need to recognize the saying that if God is for us, who could be against us? And that God's not called us to live from trouble to trouble, but God's called us to live from glory to glory. He's not called us to live from pain to heartbreak. He's called us to live from glory to glory. Shining brighter and brighter each day. 
So, Father, we ask that you would look into our hearts. And if there's things, Lord, that we need to repent for, we need to ask for forgiveness, Lord God, I pray that we would do that right now. Forgive my attitude, Lord God. Forgive my disappointments, Lord. experience this week, Lord Jesus, just cleanse my heart and my mind. I ask that you'd forgive me, Lord Jesus. I want to be the best version of myself, not only for me, but for my family and for my community, Lord Jesus. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your peace. Whether you're in the room or you're online and you're saying, hey, I want to draw close to God this morning. and I'm not sure about my relationship with Jesus. I want to pray with you. Like we said, speak what you expect. Use your mouth. It's the power of confession. It's the power of your speech. It's the power of your words. If you feel far from God this morning or you feel like you've just been struggling or just having a hard time, let's pray together. You could just repeat after me. I'll pray and you could just, if you'd say it together, say, Jesus, I ask that you forgive me. Cleanse my heart. believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave for me. Today I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. Amen. Father, I thank you for every single heart that prayed that prayer, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that there would be great, great joy and great, great excitement, Lord God to lean into all that you have for us, Lord God, to recognize your goodness, Lord God, to recognize your grace, Lord God, to have a a renewed sense, Lord God, not only in our minds, not only in our hearts, Lord God, but just around us, Lord Jesus, that we would recognize your beauty and your glory. I thank you, Lord God, for this day. I thank you for everyone here. We pray.